Hello, y'all. Welcome to the 2022-2023 Bay Area Urban Debate League. This is the open base skills based practice where we are practicing with students on um, our skills and we're learning about different things as it relates to the open division. So if you ever miss a practice, check us out on our YouTube channel within the playlist skill based practice open skill based practice 2022-2023 playlist within our YouTube channel. Um, Review this at home, review this within your practice debates, um, or just if you need to review the, you if you've been here before and you want to go over it, come back and watch it again. Um, so today we will be going over some scholarship, some production of knowledge, some epistemology, and the epistemology we're going to be um, looking at uh, will be um, based off of Paula Fear's book, Pedagogy of the pedagogy of the oppressed so i have a presentation before i get into the presentation of course i want to sh um, share my screen really quickly you only need to read um here in um in this pdf um the introduction chapter one two three and four that's the only thing that's really pertinent to read um and then there is there's also a study guide that has vocabulary you want to pay attention to. There's questions and pages that you may want to pay attention to. So it breaks down, it talks about the tenets of banking education. What are those tenets? There's 10 of them. So it goes all over all those things that's, that it covers within each chapter. Um, and so it asks questions, you know, it talks about themes. So Within that reading, just review, just make sure you understand these questions and these themes um, that are located within each chapter. Okay. Um, so um, we're gonna get straight into it, our presentation on Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So um, this is the book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Some of you have a physical copy. Again, if you don't have a physical copy, you can find the physical copy. I'm posted on Slack. You can also find the study guide posted on Slack. The book, if you, if for whatever reason you have an issue, you can also um, Google search Paula Fear, Pedagogy of the Press um, within a search engine and um, also type in PDF and you'll be able to find a PDF posted that hopefully has all four chapters. So make sure you find one of those PDFs that help have all four chapters. You can also go to your library. This is a very popular book. Shouldn't be hard to find. The author's name is Paula Fear. Paula Fier was born um, in um, oops, hold on. Paula Fier was born in Brazil. I don't know how to say that city's name. I don't speak Portuguese, <laughs> but that's where he was born in Brazil, in one of the larger cities of Brazil. Um, he grew up in a time that was greatly impacted by the Great Depression. He, um, I have this book as well. Hold on. So this book can also be found in the office. Typically, hold on, let me get back to the screen. Sorry, you all. I have to really edit this. Okay. So yes, um, Paul Fier also um, gets his um, form of academic, academic thought. His scholarship is based off of Frantz Fernand's work. Um, Wretched of the Earth. Um, I've also read this book as well. Um, and um, this book is also made available in the office. I do have a few copies of this if anyone wants to borrow it. You may be able to also find a PDF version of this book if you want to do further research on this same line of scholarship. He studied at that at a university in which he, in that city in which he was born in. I don't know the name of that city. He studied law, he studied psychology. Um, well, he studied the psychology of language um, and how language is useful, but he also studied philosophy, particularly phenomenal, 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 I can't say it today, phenomenal, phenomenal, why can't I say it today? Phenomenology. <laughs> and I've actually used that type of line of thought within debate. Phenomenology is a philosophical point of view that you should look more into as well. Um, he married another instructor. Um, he died of heart failure, failure 
in Sao Paulo in 1997. Paulo Freire's philosophy of education, key concepts. First of all, Paulo Freire was born in Recife, Brazil and raised in a middle-class family. He grew up through the Great Depression and outward symbols, such as his father always wearing a tie and having a German-made piano in their home, pointed to the family's middle-class heritage, but stood in contrast to their actual conditions of poverty. Reflecting on their situation, Friary noted, We shared the hunger, but not the class. After completing secondary school, and with gradual improvement in his family's financial situation, he was able to enter university, and became a teacher. Through his early years, working with impoverished youth, Friary became convinced that traditional pedagogy was oppressive and dehumanizing. Thus, he worked to develop a pedagogy that could liberate through conscientization. In the 1960s, he led a massive popular education movement in Brazil to deal with massive illiteracy. By 1963 to 1964, his methods have spread and there were courses for coordinators in all Brazilian states with the aim of reaching 2 million illiterates. Friary was imprisoned following the 1964 coup d'etat as the new regime considered his teaching to be subversive. On his release, he went into exile and was unable to return to Brazil until 1979. In what follows, I will briefly sketch the key concepts of Friary's philosophy of education, which he developed in his seminal work titled Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Please continue to take notes. On Banking System of Education In Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Friary states that traditionally, education is framed as an act of depositing, in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. The task of the teacher, in traditional education, Friary argues, is to fill the students with the content of his narration content, which is detached from reality, disconnected from the totality that engendered them and could give them significance. This type of education, he believes, is suffering from narration sickness. He suggests that in such schools, the task of the student is to receive, memorize, and repeat. This, he believes, turns them into receptacles to be filled by the teacher. Hence, in such an environment, teachers are active while students are passive members of the classroom community. Friary argues that the interests of the two are different in such relationship. Here, Friary argues that teachers promote the goal of the oppressors by depositing information into the students. It is this manner of education that Friary describes as the banking system of education. Friary then created a list of items that he says show how schools and classrooms can be evaluated. If a school or classroom can be defined by the following categories, then they represent the banking concept of education. This list includes 1. The teacher teaches and the students are taught. 2. The teacher knows everything and the students know nothing. 3. The teacher thinks and the students are thought about. 4. The teacher talks and the students listen meekly. 5. The teacher disciplines and the students are disciplined. 6. The teacher chooses and enforces his choice, and the students comply. 7. The teacher acts and the students have the illusion of acting through the action of the teacher. 8. The teacher chooses the program content, and the students, who were not consulted, adapt to it. 9. The teacher confuses the authority of knowledge with his own professional authority, which he sets in opposition to the freedom of the students. 10. The teacher is the subject of... If they are going too fast, I will also post this video in the study guide so you can review and take notes. Um, but I'll also be pointing to you where you can find this within the actual text of the PDF, okay? So this stuff that's here, these definitions and 
and and and and and and, and theoretical viewpoints. Um, they will be in the study guide as well, but I'll also provide you this URL. The learning process. While the pupils are mere objects. Fruit claims that education based on this model, which he calls the banking objects. Fruit claims that education based on this model, which he calls the banking annuals. 10. The teacher is the subject of the learning process, while the pupils are mere objects. Fruit claims that education based on this model, which he calls the banking annuals the student's creative power and serves the interests of the oppressors. He further asserts that education, as the exercise of domination stimulates the credulity of students with the ideological intent, often not perceived by educators, of indoctrinating them to adapt to the world of oppression. He explains that the banking concept assumes a person to be merely in the world, not with the world or with others. The individual is a spectator, not recreator. He suggests that the banking system does not see a person as a conscious being, which he calls corpo conscient. For in the banking system, a person is rather the possessor of a consciousness, an empty mind passively open to the reception of deposits of reality from the world outside. On problem posing pedagogue, ideal method of education. As we can see, Friary is widely known for his radical educational ideas called critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy is described as an educational movement guided by the passion and principle to help students develop consciousness of freedom, recognize authoritarian tendencies, and connect knowledge to power and the ability to take constructive action. Arguing against the banking concept of education, Friary argues that education must begin with the solution of the teacher-student contradiction by reconciling the poles of the contradiction so that both are simultaneously or at the same time teachers and students. It is necessary for Friary that the educational goal of deposit making is replaced with the posing of the problems of human beings in their relations with the world. Education based on problem posing ensures active teachers and active students within the classroom and the global community. The interests of both the teachers and the students, then, within the problem-posing classroom, become the same. In fact, Friary maintains that problem-posing education aims at the emancipation of those who have been subjected to domination. Friary claims that problem-posing education enables teachers and students to become subjects of the education process by overcoming authoritarianism and alienating intellectualism. It also enables people to overcome their false perception of reality. This overcoming of the false perception of reality is considered the true measurement of growth. It is thus obvious that, as Friary suggests, the banking concept entails intellectual alienation and prevents growth. On dialogue, a critical tool in ideal education. Friary argues that freedom from alienation is impossible without dialogical relations between the student and the teacher. For Friary, it is only dialogue that ensures student-teacher relationship in which the teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches but one who is himself taught in dialogue with the students, who in turn while being taught, also teach. They become jointly responsible for a process in which all grow. Friary also argues that dialogue promotes critical thinking because it is only through questioning the problems in our lives that we can take steps to remake them. Therefore, to be an active participant in the community, one needs to be in constant dialogue with the state and within the state, that is, with the other members of the state. It is therefore through dialogue that we can attain critical consciousness. But it must be noted that for Friary, critical consciousness does not only include apprehending the inequalities in one's life, but also taking action in order to change them. 
Critical consciousness, then, entails both consciousness and praxis taking practical action to deal with oppressive realities in life. Therefore, Friary believes that the problem posing method along with critical consciousness and praxis lead to education as the practice of freedom. In sum, the central theme of Friary's pedagogy is critical consciousness and praxis, that is, the act of becoming aware of inequalities and taking action to change them. On democratic education. Friary believes that freedom from the authoritarian education leads to growth and hence the creation of a true democratic society. For Friary, societies and individuals can only grow where they are provided with such an opportunity. This growth does not favor the oppressor and, therefore, the oppressor tends to manipulate growth through intellectual censorship. Friary opines that the authoritarian anti-dialogue violates the nature of human beings, their process of discovery, and it contradicts democracy. Hence, dialogue, for Friary, helps us denounce the structures of oppression and seek a less unjust, less cruel, more democratic, less discriminatory, less racist, less sexist world. Lastly, according to Friary, Education for democracy requires freedom from the authoritarian relationship. And for Friary, it can only happen if we, through dialogue and critical thinking, challenge the oppressor and in so doing create a democratic society where people willingly engage in never-ending dialogues, listen to each other, ask questions, critically think, take positions in regard to these questions, and in so doing oppose the inequalities in their lives. This is what Friary calls active learning. Any thoughts? No one has any thoughts. I have a question then. How does some of this relate to debate? Um, so in our case in particular, because we do uh, K debates, like we're trying to question the status quo. And this has a lot to do with it because the status quo generally goes unquestioned, and there's generally like a lot of, um, you know, whiteness and the systems bind it as a default, and no one really stands to question those. So this as a new way of like pedagogy and whatnot helps us kind of see, you know, there's other ways of education, and um, there's other ways to approach this status quo and like kind of question it and break it down, which is a lot to do with what we do in debate. Yeah, so I think one of the things he said was um, that you have to take action and you have to take an active role, right? And so for me, my thought is, you know, a lot of you all see a lot of these debaters just reading plan text, right? But they're not stemming from their own personal advocacy. Like none of us work for NATO. None of us work for the United States federal government, right? So how can we use, I think he's talking about actually using what I talk about a lot of times is personal advocacy, right? Because if you're not using personal advocacy, then you are not using pedagogy of the oppressed because a lot of what pedagogy of the press calls for is subjectivity, for you to see the lens through the eyes of your own personalhood, through your own as, I think as Mr. Amos was talking about it at practice the other day, um, Romero, it has to come through your own personal, political, economic, cultural, you know, if you're man, woman, it has to come from some understanding of who your identity politic is. If you're Black, if you're Jewish, if you are uh, whatever, right? Those identity politics have a way of situating itself in the world, right? And so what is it, how can we incorporate those understandings of oppression so that those people are no longer oppressed, right? And if we continue to not speak on our identity politics and not speak from our subjectivity or speak from our personal agency, then we're not able to eradicate a lot of the things we see in the world. Because, you know, a lot of times we feel like we don't have a hand in it until it knocks on our front door, but we always have a hand in how our world is unjust and unfair. So the other thing he talks about was um, um, the banking system. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on the banking system? I 
Oh, I don't know. I guess I thought it was pretty cool because kind of reminded me of some of the older schooling I had in relation to like June Jordan now because I feel like my older school definitely did try to have like a bit of a different sort of education system that was more like equal but I still feel like it kind of reminded me of that where it was mainly just like even though there was some like interaction between teacher and student it was mainly just like teacher like giving information um, and then like in some of the more recent schools I've attended I've seen that they really try to like have that kind of philosophy I suppose in them and like I don't know it just kind of reminded me of like the duality between those two things and how things are changing but also think about like debate right like how debate has not really necessarily changed right and you know as much as we you know know about imperialism and all these things we continue to have United States federal government as the agent right mm -hmm. we still don't there's still urban debate leagues that exist, right? And those people who do have um, access to those knowledges of debate, right? We just had people come to us the other day and say, there are rules, right? And um, at one of our practices, and there are real people who really think that there is a limit in the understanding of what education is. That's why you hear teams say, the voters are for education and fairness, or the voters are for jurisdiction, or that we chose to vote for this year's topic, right? But when it comes to the vote, the UDLs, we have to, when we vote as a UDL, we don't get like multiple votes. Like all of the, like, all right, so my debate team had its own budget, but we were also part of a UDL. Luckily, I was able to vote twice because my school would vote, but also my UDL would, that I would tend to vote it. But a lot of your schools don't have that operation where your coaches understand a lot of the inner workings, right? So as we work as a league, we work as a league where a lot of teams who also, there's other leagues, there's the Catholic League or whatever, there's the these other leagues, but they don't move the same way we move. And it's like, why are there certain gatekeepers to this activity, right? Like, why? Why, why is there, why is it that only the universities produce these knowledges. And most of these universities are not HBCU. <laughs> Morgan State University is not making the evidence. Florida A&M is not making the evidence. These, these institutions that are of color are not primarily contributing to the dialogue that's happening within debate. So I want y'all to think about these things as it relates to, in context to debate, right? So I just want to make that a, a moment to think about for a second. All right, so back to this um, presentation. Think So I want you to think about like the parts of pedagogy. What, did, what does he mean by student-teacher contradiction, right? What, what does he mean by that? What inhibits um, the, the, the ability for a teacher to be active, right? Um, yeah, but we're gonna go through some of these things so you can have some of these things just as an introduction. This is not the full in-depth story because we'll go into this full in-depth story two weeks from now. There'll be a pop quiz. So I'm gonna give you two weeks. So you have next a practice to go over the text and then we'll come back next next Thursday to do like, a, make sure you got this information in your head and we'll talk about how these concepts relate to debate more. All right, so the basic theory of Paulo Freire is that education was a means to building a critical consciousness that would enable people to create change in their lives. So he thought that critical consciousness, that idea would have impact on how people saw themselves as it relates to the, not just as it relates to education, but how it relates to the rest of the world. And, and truth be told, um, that, had, that truthfully did have an a, impact on me because it really helped facilitate the debate career that I had, as well as be a leader in this debate community, right? And so um, I read this book my sophomore year, and it really changed my life, not just as it relates to debate, but what it meant to me as a an, a, as a social practitioner, as, an, um, as a person who does advocacy, community work, civic work. It was really um, beneficial. His philosophy on helping me get my start um, in my, I guess, my debate career, my public speaking career, my, my, my community career, all of that. It's very beneficial. What is pedagogy? Well, pedagogy is um, the method and practice of teaching, especially as an academic subject or a theoretical concept, and is influenced by the social, political, psychological, 
and economic and cultural development of learners. I had to add those because it didn't it, it doesn't say that there. But yes, economic and cultural as well. Remember, Paulo Fier did stem from Marxist thought and Plato and Plato philosophy. So um, and he also comes from anti-colonialist thought. So keep that in mind as well. So he does have these ways of understanding cultural understanding, economic understandings, and that those things also have impact on how we see the world and how we practice and conduct certain ways of understanding and productions of knowledge. And debate does the same thing. Debate has ways of developing productions of knowledge. And I think this could be an interesting thing to use as we as people say, well, you've been debating this style. There's been people like Matheno, Toya, Ryan Rosh, Dave and Love, these great people who have made changes in debate, right? You have all these people of color uh, who have really campaigned for diversity and debate, and still these practices exist. Well, again, Paulo Fier talks about the never ending. Remember that second video we watched? Paulo Fier talks about the never ending importance of this dialogue because of the fact that, it, as Sam says, it's being so pervasive, right? And as this is a theoretical concept um, that has made itself um, seem subject, right? But it's really object because it is influenced so pervasively, pervasively within our social, political, economic, cultural, and psychological ways of developing and learning. What is the purpose of pedagogy of the press? Well, the purpose of it is to increase access to education. And so when you're talking, when people are like, this is for education, education for who? Who is this educational for? You running these arguments thinking that black people want to talk about, if, this, if we know that this hurts our communities, why would we advocate for that? This is why there's no black people joining the community now, because most of the people who have access are people who can go to Head Roy. Westminster, college prep. How are you providing access to those people who don't have access to the same education that you have? So make it about the debate, make it about what's performatively happening within specifically the debate round. You can make it theoretical as well. And you talk about what's happening, but also you should be making it about what's happening in the debate world, right? And what change can you do as a debater within your role of the ballot within the debate space, within this actual debate room in real time, not fiat, not no magic wand that pretends that you're going to do something as a federal government. No, what do you do in this within your speech act within this debate space? And be specific. I said this. I use this philosophy. I was talking about these methods, and so the, and and these methods are better. They're more democratic. They're more critical thinking than whatever their framework is. And that's where you want to kind of pivot, and 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 not even just framework. You can use these arguments. Even if you're saying, if it seems like this is the best form of populism or this is the best form of democracy, you can be like, no, Paulo Fier said that this is the best. So you can make this a diss ad. You don't have to necessarily make this, or you can make it a straight turn. You can make this a critique. Um, you don't have to do like that bigger wave of critique that Sam is talking about. You can just do like straight up Paulo Fier, pedagogy of the press, good. And you don't do that. So it doesn't have to be that like fourth wave. It doesn't have to be that it doesn't have to be a performative critique where you have to have poems and stuff. You can just do straight up critique or some type of dissad or 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 um, straight turn. Um, he talks about um, there's distinction between the oppressed and the oppressors. So you should try to, how does he define who is oppressed? How does he define who's the oppressor? He talks about that in the book. I think between chapter one and chapter two, he talks about revolutionizing the educational spaces and therefore you revolutionize the world, right? So if there is this big focal point for us to be in these classrooms and that situates how we, we spend what, like eight, like almost what, 12 years of our lives, like almost like 12 years of our lives or more in at least high school. Right. So or, or well, between elementary school to high school. Right. So that is a lot. That's that's more than a decade. Right. So that, that literally should have impact on how you have trajectory in the future and becoming a future leader and becoming a change maker of tomorrow. Right. So those spaces are going to have impact. And right. If you're not using a form of pedagogy of the press, you're going to create individuals and leaders who are more like Trump rather than more like Martin Luther King. And that's why the world is effed up, right? And that's why we have people not listening to the world. That's why we have cyclone bombs. And that's why if they want to talk about, um, and that's why we have militarism and destruction of the world and debris, because people don't care. 
right? There's no active pedagogy. It's idle pedagogy. And so you can start turning some of their impacts. Liberate the voices of the oppressed, right? Um, that's the purpose of what he intends to do is to make sure that people are empowered and they're not just taking on what the, the, the majority or not even the majority, it's really the minority, they, but they make themselves seem as the majority, right? So it's minority rule. How do we stop minority rule from controlling the majority of the voices of the oppressed, right? And it's a, it's a matter of standing up. If more of us stand up, it won't be no minority rule. And I think that's what he's getting to. And that revolutionary, that's the, the, the little bad boy messing up the classroom. Yeah, we need that. So when these teams are like, we need education, we need stability. You need to be like, no, that is, that is not what we need. If a little kid wants to burn up, that's they already doing it now at y'all schools, right? I know they did it in my high school. They were constantly burning the, 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 the bathroom, right? So why do these forms of violence happen in our schools? Students need an outlet. Student needs are looking for a voice. Uh, six principles of pedagogy of the press is to challenge, to explain, to create some modeling. So where people are like, how do we do this? Well, the per one of the tenets of being a part of pedagogy of the press is to be active, right? So you can tie this into your Warren and Facet evidence or your Black aesthetic evidence that says um, that we need to provide an aesthetic that other people can use. We need to provide a practice and a pragmatic practice that is critical understanding of the world around us, truthfully understanding of the world around us that other people can model, that we deliberate on how that, that practice actually function, what were the results. We question it, we provide feedback and we do it all over again. Challenge it again, right? Banking and education. So this is another concept. So banking education is basically um, how forms of oppression are created. It tells people that uh, Western education is the primary form, a uh, primary uh, is the primary um, is the primary mode of thought that Western European education is the primary mode of thought. That anything that doesn't exist within that paradigm of banking education that I have the knowledge, you take it in. Right. This is a, if you think about um, I think Sam had made this point, too, before. Um, and I don't know if there's been other I think Thomas from um, Kip King talking about missionary workers and how they use church and the reading of the Bible. Right. That you a lot of times when people learn how to read back in the day, they use the Bible. Right. And how missionaries would force people um, to read the Bible and force them to have Western forms of religion right? That would then lead them because religion dictates your whole life for a lot of people, right? So if, I, if I've been forced to have education that is tied to Western religion, right, then my framework or understanding of, subjecti of subjectivity has been taken away from me. There's an erasure of who I truthfully am, right? Now, if you go in and choose to change, that's fine. But this is talking about people being forced to live under certain parts of land, having to be forced to, and, and it's not like these people were, um, were like, hey, here's this book, read it. People were being whipped and beaten and, and, and raped and, 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 for, and bombs and military attacks were forcing people to, to not have access to their own resources and then enabled them to only sap the resources and educational systems that were, um, that, you know, had been settled on their land. So there was this dictatorship and there was this even greater understanding, not by the method of the banking system alone, but also the, the system of oppression of Western dictatorship that also furthered that form of banking educational system. Praxis. Now, praxis is a way in which um, he talks about being um, needing to be at the, think of praxis being at the axis. How do we create change, right? We can only create change unless we have some theory of understanding, right? We reflect on it and we act. If they, if they don't have some form of praxis in the debate round, they can't win the debate. 
because there, there's no way that they're going to be able to create change. It's like doing the same. It's like doing. It's, it's like expecting to get new results doing the same thing. That's idiotic. You're not going to get the. You're not going to get any new results if you're getting the same action. So if they're operating within the same cultural default centered location of whiteness, that's the same action. We we know what whiteness gets us. So why continue to do it? So that's why Paula Freer says that we must reflect, theorize new forms of action and then act on them and then do it again. And again, it goes back to that thing about like challenging modeling and all that, those um, components to pedagogy. What are the three levels of oppression? Well, there's interpersonal. There's the like, if I, if somebody was to like come to be, if a, if a student, if like one debater from Bottle was like, Mathino, you a darky, you a nigglet or something like that, that would be very offensive, right? Or if somebody said, women can't be debaters, right? That's uh, if some, you know, if that was, or said, you know, if someone came to Ella and said, you can't be a debater because you're a middle schooler, that's personal one-to-one -one oppression. Institutional oppression is systematic, right? And that's where there's structures that are in place to make sure that something remains to exist. And then there's the naturalized or the internalized in terms of what we think is true about the world. So now that we see the systems in place all the time, we think that this is just like, like when people argue realism, you need to be like, realism is only made by internalized indoctrinated forms of oppression. That's your answer to realism. That it's only because we believe that this is realist. We believe that that Russia is going to always be Russia because we have internalized Western forms of knowledge. Um, we have internalized forms of um, understanding that anyone who's from Eastern Europe doesn't hold the same ideas, political understandings. You know, th they are, they've been otherized, right? much like a lot of the Asian community or, you know, a lot of the communities that whiteness tends to do, right? We begin to understand that that is okay, right? And then there's videos, you know, you see these videos of kids um, and, and they show the different races and kids always choose. If you, if you, if you see them like, um, if you YouTube those videos of where kids be like, oh, which would you rather have, a white doll, a beige doll, a, a blue doll? Mo a lot of these kids choose white doll, if they are a minority, right? But that's because of the naturalized um, understanding of, of, of where we think whiteness is just a part, we just gotta deal with it. It's natural. And that's not the case. We make the world, the world is made of social constructs. Um, the three components of pedagogy is curriculum. So understanding what is, what is being taught, I can't spell. That is not how you spell what. Um, so uh, it's the understanding of what is being taught. There's a method. So how are we teaching, right? And so when you think about, you know, challenging some of these teams, you need to be like, you know, well, you, you're you using a method that's already been used, that's been used and replicated over and over again that also stems from whiteness. So your method is not what works. And so a lot of times you need to have debate on method. It's fine to talk about NATO. That's fine. But the way in which you talk about it, right? The way in which you continue to situate and reaffirm whiteness through the way in which you conducted certain conversations in this debate. You're saying you're looking for liberation, but how can you look for liberation when the, the axis of your praxis is still from point zero? It's still, we haven't changed the way in which we build a topic since what, the 1950s or something? And you can Google this. You can Google all the chosen topics and, 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 but talk about specifically, how do we conduct the debate space? How do we say what, how we learn? How have we chosen norms to tell us how we are taught within this rigorous form of what's supposed to be uh, educational enrichment activity? So you want to change, you want to challenge the methods of debate because they're going to say that these are the standards and these are the methods of debate. You need to be like, no, these methods suck. They provide us no real techniques for creating actual change. This creates bad forms of understanding what it means to be a leader. And also the, the third component of pedagogy is techniques for socializing children and 
the repertoire of cognitive and effective skills for successful functioning in society. We want to make sure that people feel confident, right? Feel like they are able to have some affect on the world, right? And that they are cognitively able to create change, right? And it's going to feel hard, right? It's going to feel challenging, but to know, to, to be able to critically think and be like, if I set these pieces up, for these children or for myself. It's not about children or for my family. Again, pedagogy is about teaching the community and building a better society by allowing us all to learn together. So how do we create an effective safe space for people to learn and be critical thinkers and for people to have active roles in their form of education? And, they're, and not just education, but education is meant to be used to have some type of utility and some type of function, right? So that function that's in play, right? How do we activate it for it to create some actual form of change? So it's about, again, about being an active, what does he say? The word was being- um, Active learner, active learner. Yes, exactly. An active learner and an active teacher, exactly. And you can be, do both of those. You can do one of those. Sometimes it changes, right? And that's why he says it's a never ending story because you're gonna, like I, I've told Sam about this concept before and you wanna put this um, concept down. The concept is called opacity or phenomenolo phenomenolo phenomenology. Phenomenology is just what it means. Being a phenomenon, being special, being unique. It makes me wanna play that Beyonce song. I'm an alien superstar, baby. Or like that poem that um, Nuriel had about being like the river, or being like a snake or being like jazz, right? Being fluid, never being defined. You're always becoming, right? I'm, I'm about to become 33, right? So we're never solid in our identity. The identities is always becoming. There's always a becoming of blackness. There's always a becoming of being Muslim. There's always a becoming of being Jew. There's always a becoming of even the understanding of what it means to be white. There's always a becoming of that. So no identity is static. There's no identity that can be essentialized. So you are the best method to stopping essentialization. When there's bad forms of representation that clearly misrepresents people who are oppressed, when people just blindly say, oh, we saw POCs. What, what, what are you talking about? There's all forms of POCs. Talk specific. What is that form of critical thinking that stems from the minds? Because only the oppressed can liberate the oppressed. That's another thing that Apollo Fierce says, that only the oppressed can liberate the oppressed. So how are you doing this? Are you oppressed? Are you speaking from your own subjectivity? Does your own subjectivity speak to the inter inter interconnectedness of multiple identities that creates a, an opportunity for a diverse, um, phenomenal, um, opaque, um, becoming of change, multiplicity. That's another word, multiplicity. Because you want a multiplicity of change. You don't want your change to be static. There we go. <laughs> Here's a little graph. Um, so yes, so here's the outer. Getting familiar, you know, Scribbling, jotting some ideas down, writing some ideas, kind of focusing, you know, pretending to read books. Maybe you might label some books. You might start playing with language or whatever. But then you start to really endure and you really start to grapple with books. You really start to like, when you really read this book and you really go through the um, study guide, that's when you're really enduring the challenge of connecting yourself with text and figuring out how can you challenge your critical thinking. So you want to endure the reading. All right, really, really, really endure the reading because that helps you become um, a person who can be able to critically reflect on ideas of ped critical pedagogy, but to put ped critical ped pedagogy in practice. Some of these things are, um, I'm going backwards, that's why. Okay, the stages of pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, Freer, um describes two different stages of pedagogy of the oppressed. At the first step, the oppressed unveil the world of oppression. So you have to mirror, you have to mirror oppression back on itself. So you have to show the oppressor, you're hurting me. You have to show people that this is oppression so that they can be able to transform it and use forms of praxis. 
by reflecting on the world around them so they can actually create um, social forces that would enable change. Cultural silence is when you don't say nothing or you omit to say anything, right? And, um, and it reflects from the oppressor's worldview. So if they're using any tools or understanding or coming from Ivory League perspectives, or they're not coming from the voice of the oppressed, and they're not using those, if they're not speaking to the, those 10 tenets, the, if they're using banking education system, any of those 10 tenets, they're not stemming from the uh, point of view of the oppressed. And they're using forms of the oppressor. And you, and again, um, the oppressor, you can also be, understand that you can also be sub oppressors. He, he does talk about sub oppression. Um, so be mindful of uh, that you can also be the oppressor, right? And that understand that hierarchy is again, not rigid, right? I'm a black person, but even as a black person, I have privilege that certain black people don't have. Right. So there's always going to be hierarchies. So you have to be mindful to in order to create the best form of liberation. You have to be mindful of your political, cultural, economic. Like I didn't grow up in the projects. Right. I, I didn't grow up in federal housing. I grew up in a neighborhood that had federal housing, but my, we we had rent and we had to pay it. Right. So I, I have to understand that there is certain folks that did have to. Grow, there may have been a lot of black folks who did have to grow up in that. So. I still have to understand that I can also be a sub oppressor. We can, there's, like I said, women can be sexist, right? So just be mindful of those things about cultural silence. Here's some of the other books that Paulo Fear has written. Be my, you, you might want to check those out. The most important book I think you should read is Cultural, no, sorry, Education for, cultural, for Critical Consciousness. That's a good one. I actually have that book. Uh, pedagogy of hope we live in pedagogy of the oppressed some of these are more like essays but some of these are his other written books and we're going to stop there we're going to um there'll be day two so day two we'll get into day two not next week but we'll get into day two that following week after we have practice debates okay and then um just again i'm going to share my screen and go over the, the study guide Maybe there's some things here that um, y'all might want to consider. Um, fear of freedom, that's something you want to look at. Cultural silence, uh, that's something you want to look at when you read the text, Critical Consciousness. We've already defined it, um, but look, make sure you know what, what he's talking about. The first chapter, he talks about generosity, the difference between humanitarianism and humanism. That dichotomy, you want to know the dichotomy of, again, the two student teacher relationship and that contradiction also understand what he means by the student teacher contradiction what does he mean by the oppressor oppressed contradiction right um are these spell points for you to just like make sure you have an understanding for them or? yes these are actual vocabulary words and you should I try see. to define them what does he mean by liberation what does he mean by invasion what does he mean by limit situation um what does he be my, mean by new man objectivity um Praxis, what does he mean by reconciling? What does he mean by being a sub oppressor? What does he mean by untested feasibility? What do those things mean? What does he be mean by prescribed behavior? His, just a shot in the dark. What does prescribed behavior mean? The behavior that people are like supposed to have, maybe. Yeah, the, it's the it's the again that unquestionable thing that you just do because it's by nature. The thing that you've 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 internalized right so it's the thing that's already been it's kind of like a preconceived think about like pre already determined right it's like those de those behaviors that are already determined what are some of the there's a lot of behaviors that are, are that are already determined that create colonial colonialist thought um thoughts that are that reaffirm whiteness right what does he mean by reconcile right um, and so, um, yeah, that's, we'll stop there, but, um, how much time do we have left? We can do a little bit more. So the next part of what I want to do is let's take a, a look at chapter one and maybe just, let's, let's read some of it together. All right. So, um, do I have it up? Let's see. 
Okay, it's in Safari though. It's all right. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go to chapter one, and then I'm gonna have is Harper with us. Harper, you there? Yes, I'm. Here. Okay, we're not gonna read read the introduction. Read the introduction on your own. Okay, but we're gonna start on chapter one, and I want you to read it for us, Harper. As soon as I get there, go forward. Okay, wait, wait till I get there. Dang. Okay. The introduction and the preface is not that long. All right, go ahead. While the problem of humanization has always been from an axiological point of view, been humankind's central problem, it now takes on the character of an inescapable concern. Concern for humanization leads at once to the recognition of dehumanization, not only as an ontological possibility, but as a historical reality. Stop, 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 stop right there. Stop right there. What does that mean? So basically what he's saying is that when we start like having an actual concern for what humanization is, we start to realize that there is a colonialist legacy that is actively dehumanizing people. Yes, good job, Sam. All right, Sam, you want to pick up from there? Sure. Um, Stop at the end of the um, paragraph. Yeah. Are we at and in its initial... Where are yep. we at? Yep. Right. That's right. And as an individual perceives the extent to which dehumanization, he or she asks if humanization is a viable possibility. Within history and concrete objective contexts, both humanization and dehumanization are possibilities for a person as an um, uncompleted being of conscious to their incompletion. Does anybody want to speak on that, Ella? Um. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, he said, um, if an individual, meaning you or anybody else, perceives the extent, you have, meaning you have to see how hurtful, how impactful, how detrimental the extent of, um, of, of dehumanization, how bad oppression is, you have, to, you have to unveil, again, unveil to really see how bad dehumanization is to see the possibility to be able to see any viable option to escape it, right? So in order for, for us to see a viable option of being able to escape it, we must understand dehumanization and the extent of it first. Then he goes on to say, we must understand history. We must understand how it works concretely. He says that we must understand context um, and we must understand both what we seem to understand what humanization is and what dehumanization does and how there's possibilities for people who've been made incomplete um, for their consciousness um, and, and, and their minds that are incomplete. So it's not just being incomplete in terms of a person, your material incompleteness, but also your psychological incompleteness. Because people use, there's a lot of people out in the street, not because they choose to, but because of mental illness, right? So there's a lot of people who are suffering and not, and even there's people who suffer functionally like that. There's a lot of people in the world in the workforce who deal with like trauma from racism. You deal with trauma from sexism. Like it hurts psychologically. All right. Um, next person, I'll have Romero. Was it Both. But while humanization? Is that where I'm yep. at? Okay, yep. sorry. But while both humanization and dehumanization are real alternatives, only the first is the people's vocation. This vocation is constantly negated, yet it is affirmed by that very negation. It is thwarted by injustice, exploitation, oppression, and the violence of the oppressors. It is affirmed by the yearning of the oppressed for freedom and justice and by their struggle to recover from their lost humanity. You want to explain that for us, Romero? Uh, well, I think it's like saying first that humanization and dehumanization are both things that like can happen a person or can um but people seem to like want to be humanized and then it says that uh even if people want to be humanized in general and that seems to be like the, the good thing whatever that's still like thwarted by like basically the powers that be all the the sort of ways that humans are uh oppressed basically yeah by the things that are happening and the things that we affirm right the things that we mm. that yeah. we 
tend to agree to, right? The things that we say should become true and the things that we put in action, right? Those are the things that sometimes allow for that injustice, exploitation, oppression of violence to exist. Um, and it's, it makes it even harder for us to recover the humanity of people because there's a huge extent of that oppression happening. Yeah, and then it also says in addition to that, that like it's the people's vocation for humanity. Yes, good job, Sam. Good job, yes. Yeah, so like that's a job. People go out there and they humanize. Dehumanization is not a job. That's just the status quo. That's the powers that are making things happen. Yes. Um, yeah. People do need to understand that it, it, it takes a great deal of work to be an organizer and to be a person who's a social activist. It takes a great deal of work. Um, and it takes a great, again, it goes back into, it take, it's a, it's, it could be taxing to the brain. It could be traumatic. But again, and also they say, you know, um, um, you know, it's, um, to be ignorant is to be is is to have bliss, right? And so a lot of times people feel like you're unhappy when you know about these things, because and so it becomes kind of aware on you, right? And so yeah, so it does. It, it's kind of like putting yourself on the line and putting your your brain on the line. Um, does who who hasn't read? Um, Daniel, you still there with us? Yep. All right. Why don't you read the next paragraph? All right. Uh, dehumanization with marks. Yep. All right. Uh, dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also through in a different way, a those who have stolen it, is distortion of the vocation and of becoming more fully human. This distortion occurs is within history, but it is not a historical vocation. And indeed, to admit it of dehumanization and as an historical vocation would lead either to cynicism or total despair. The struggle for humanization, for the emancipation of labor, for the overcoming of alienation, for the affirmation of men and women as persons would be meaningless. This struggle is possible only because dehumanization, although a concrete historical fact, is not a given destiny, but the result of an unjust order or that in the, engenders violence in, in the oppressors, which in turn dehumanizes the oppressed. Okay, do you, want, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, seems to be saying that if we go with the idea that dehumanization is the status quo for humanity, we can't do anything to change dehumanization? Well, it says that the belief is the belief. So the idea that you think that, um, so it says that the distortion occurs within history, but it's not historical vocation. So meaning that we, um, historic, meaning that these things that we do, right, are, are the things that we choose to do, right? And so that um, it seems as if that because we, and, and because we choose to do it so much, it seems like it becomes harder for us to actually create opportunities for people to become human and to release people of their despair and to release people of that struggle, right? And so what ends up happening is that we continue to reaffirm those same practices. And because we continue to, oppress people and otherize people, right? That creates a distortion of who we really are, right? And you sap people from being who they really are because you don't allow their voice to truthfully be their voice because you strap, you strip them of their voices, right? So when you strip them of their voices, you strip them of their agency. So they have no vocation to be able to have agency over their lives, right? And so there's this idea I was talking about, I was thinking of um, called bare life which means people are become bare of life. They, th they think that they have life, but they really don't. This comes from Agabin's, um, this comes from you know the philo philosophical point of views that I like, which is Agamben and biopolitical control. You're controlling people's lives by, by controlling the fact that people, you're taking away people's ability to have autonomy over their own voice. And so, um, yeah, you continue to create alienation um, and you create this, uh, it says you create the affirmation of men and women as persons, their identity becomes meaningless, right? Uh, yeah. I think, but I do agree with Daniel in that particular paragraph is like for optimism, because like, if you see, like he's saying it's not a given destiny and right. that okay, the reason saying. why dehumanization is not a vocation is because that would lead to cynicism and total despair. And, you know, like the actual vocation of humanization 
exist to you know overcome that. I, and also, too, I think what Sam is saying too is like it's not just it's a it's a it's constant phenomenology. You're constantly doing. It. It's not just a thing in time. It's like oh, we did it, and now we're all liberated. It's liberation is going to like like he says. It's not a vocation of history, but it is constantly you yourself having the ability to be vocational. Does that make sense? So you so it's, it's it's going into what Sam is saying is that like you you can't think that oh it's going to be solved by just one action right or one moment in history it's a constant being able to challenge it does that make sense yeah okay um um who else has not read yet. That's everyone. That's everyone. Okay, I'll read the next one and then y'all can talk about it. Because it is a distortion of being more fully human, sooner or later, being less human leads the oppressed to struggle against those who made them so. In order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, which is which is a way to create it, become in turn oppressors of the oppressors but rather restores the humanity of both so what is he talking about here um so in this one he's saying basically that the struggle against oppression can't end in a complete lopsidedness where the oppressed eventually just become the oppressors because all their rage and whatnot is taken out on them um by the oppressors and similarly they do the same to the people that oppress them um and so, like, the only way to actually create a more, you know, humanized world is to have some sort of, like, regaining of humanity while also not being oppressive on either side. Right. So it's like, if, if people are like, in order for us to have liberation, white, uh, Black people must do what, it's like when people say, we should do what um, white people did to us to them. Like, no, they're the, the actual paradigm inverse... <laughs> of us doing like if Africa decided where they're going to have their own like Berlin, I don't know, the Zimbabwe conference and take over all of the world, then that, you know, then then that's not what's going to restore equality. That's not what he's, so that doesn't restore equality. And also he's talking about too, like you, you can't um, create a paradigm shift in which the inverse of like, you just topple over who's being oppressed. You know what I mean? That's not, that's not what you're supposed to do either. That's not a form of liberation. He's also saying too here that like <clears throat> in speaking for others, right? You can sometimes be the oppressed as well. I mean, you can be the oppressor as well when speaking for others, right? Um, um, and he says, in order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not in seeking to regain their humanity um, in a way to create it, but in turn, oppresses of the oppressed, but rather restores the humanity of both. So understanding that you can be the oppressed and you can't, in that moment of speaking for your community, you have to be mindful of how you speak about your community and, and where you speak from. All right, and so we're going to end it from there, continue to do this reading. This is just to get us started. Um, I would say try to finish um, chapter one and two by next Thursday. It's not that long. Like, if I pull out the book, this is literally, hold on, it's not that long at all. I promise you it's not. This is chapter one and two. That's hold on. I don't. I can't show it to you, but it's not that long. See it? It's like literally that pinch. So read chapter one and two, or I would say um, read the introduction, and then one and two. Three and four are pretty lengthy, so you can finish that next week. And then, yes, you have the study guide there to help you go through some of the concepts. It also has page numbers there where you can find some of those concepts. I didn't put the page numbers down for everything because some of that you should find yourself. Also, too, again, there will be a, a pop quiz next, not this, th that, not next Thursday, but the Thursday after next, there'll be a pop quiz. Whoever gets the best answers um, will get um, additional um, raffle tickets put in the raffle jar for skill-based practice and also it will be an additional um we'll probably do some incentive for that day too so you'll get double incentives more raffles and an actual incentive that day i don't know probably like a gift card somewhere or something so please read and study well